could get back to sleep. Just lay there reminiscing and spent some time in prayer, but I couldn't get back to sleep. So um, I'm hoping that uh, if I fall asleep, it won't be during a sermon. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> I was almost dozing off sitting there while they were practicing this morning. Moses, Jesus, and one other person are playing golf one day. Moses is up first. He hits a nice shot, but it dips and lands in a water trap. He raises his club, the water parts, and the ball rolls out of the trap. Jesus is up next. He hits an almost identical shot. Again, it landed in a water trap. The ball hovers a few inches over the surface of the water. Jesus casually strolls out, walking on the water, chips the ball up onto the green. The next person up hits a long shot, but it's going in the wrong direction. It hits a truck, bounces off, landing on the roof of the pro shop and rolling down the roof until it bounces down the course. It lands in the same water trap. A frog takes the ball in its mouth when suddenly a hawk flies down, picks up the frog, and as they fly over the green, the frog drops the ball into the hole for a perfect hole in one. And Moses turns to Jesus and says, I hate playing against your father. <laughs> you can't win. If you're playing anything against God ever, you cannot win. People think, people think they can win against God. It ain't going to happen, my friends. It ain't going to happen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. That's one of my favorite verses. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Talking about roads or paths. You ever been on the wrong road? Have you ever been on the wrong road? You remember before GPS in your, in your phone and the GPS devices that were around before that, we had MapQuest. And you printed out the map quest and it had turned here and turned there and go five miles. And, and we were on vacation one time. If we'd have followed the map quest, it would have had us in the bay. The road continued on the other side. But it would have had us, we had, we're driving on, there's the water map quest. You ever been on a journey and discovered that you were on the wrong road? You ever been that way? Think, this isn't going where I thought it would go. You ever been on a path that take you the wrong, just the wrong direction? I was in the wrong church one time, photographing a wedding. I photographed it. <laughs> and it was the wrong wedding. <laughs> That's true. It's easy for me to get mixed up and go wrong. And that was a, the people, who, the right wedding called the studio and said, where's that photographer? And I had a, an assistant there and he just ran up there and photographed the wedding that I was supposed to be at. <laughs> Meanwhile, I photographed the other wedding. But we do, we find ourselves in a, on the wrong road and in the wrong place a lot of times. I told you about the time I, I was in quicksand. I told you about that before wasn't supposed to be in the quicksand but I had a friend helping me out of there but we do sometimes we choose a wrong road we choose a path that's going to take us away from where we really ought to be we choose that path you know as kids when I was photographing high school seniors I did that for 30 for 45 years and I asked all of them what are your plans what are you going to do and a lot of them just didn't know I'm going, to de I'm going to go to college, declare, undeclared, and I don't, I don't know. And a lot of them chose things that they were never going to do. I knew they were never going to do that. Shame on the colleges for having um, majors in which you cannot make a living. <laughs> Shame on them. I'm going to go find myself. And if you need to find yourself, then you're already on the wrong road. Because you don't know where you are. Amen? Amen? Either way, 
A wrong road will lead or take us to a wrong place. Always. Wrong road, wrong place. We choose a wrong road for different reasons. Maybe we choose based on gratification. Maybe we think there's something really great at the end of this wrong road. Maybe we choose a road based on self-interest. The destination or the goal should determine the road or path that we choose, right? We, you need to have a goal and then do what you need to do to get to accomplish that goal. You know, when you, if you're preparing yourself to make a living, then you should be learning things that have marketable skills. If you're learning something that doesn't have a marketable skill, then, then you're on the wrong road. You're just in it for self-interest or, or self-gratification and you don't know the destination. A man in the book of Acts chose a road based on hate. Acts 8, verse 1, and Saul approved of their killing him. That was Stephen, the first martyr. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Saul approved of the killing of Stephen, who was stoned to death for his faith, the same faith that we have. The Greek word synodikon conveys that he consented to it with delight. He just didn't say, okay, let's stone him, but he was delighted that they were going to stone him, which is a gruesome way to kill somebody. Saul of Tarsus, or Paul of Tarsus, this was. Tarsus was a, in the province of Cilicia, located in modern-day Turkey, so he was born in Tarsus of Jewish parents. He was a tribe of, of Benjamin, which adhered to Judah. Benjamin and Judah were two tribes that stayed within the kingdom uh, of Judah when, um, when the rest of the ten tribes rebelled, the northern ten tribes, against the son of Solomon as the kingdom was changing hands. But but uh, Judah and Benjamin adhered or stayed with Judah, or Judea, as it was called then. Tarsus was a Roman city uh, with Greek leanings and Greek traditions of learning. After his education in Tarsus, Saul was sent to Jerusalem to continue his training as a Pharisee under the famous scholar Gamaliel. They called him Rabban which means Rabbi Gamaliel. He was a famous uh, rabbi scholar in Jerusalem in the Pharisee tradition. How he got this hatred of Christ followers, I don't know. He probably saw them as a threat to all that he had been taught as a disciple of Gamaliel and as a Pharisee because the Pharisees had no love at all for Jesus. So he had this virulent hatred for this new movement. And he wanted the movement exterminated. He wanted the practitioners of it dead. He wanted them dead, muerte. Acts chapter 8 and verse 3, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. So he didn't care what gender the believers were. He didn't care if he left orphans behind. Complete destruction was his goal. He hated the Christian movement. He hated it. They didn't call them Christians then, by the way, at that particular time. We don't know what Saul was like before the martyrdom of Stephen, what kind of oath he may have followed. He, he no doubt thought that he was doing the right thing. He might think, thought the path he was on was right. And his goal 
And that path was to destroy the movement they called the way, the followers of Jesus. He thought he was preserving traditional Judaism. They thought of the Christian movement as a threat to traditional Judaism. But where did the violence come from? Hamas or today's Hezbollah? Where does the hatred come from? There was a fury in Stephen's execution. Stoning was not a benign form of execution. It would kill someone with physical exertion, picking up stones and hurling them as hard as they could until the person perished. It was a bloody thing, disfigured the person. Acts chapter 7, 54 to 58, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him when they heard Stephen's testimony, this is. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. You talk about furious hatred. Verse 58, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul was on a road of his own choosing. He was passionate about his own beliefs. By the way, Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul was his Roman name. He was a product of two cultures. In Tarsus, there was a heavy Greek influence. The Stoic Greek philosophy was taught in, in Tarsus. In Jerusalem, he was trained in Hebrew law and uh, customs. He was trained as a Pharisee. They were fanatical about laws and rules and regulations and the punishment of those who would not submit. Saul not only began the persecution, but he spread it, or at least he attempted to. Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and ask him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. His purpose in bringing them to Jerusalem was not to re-educate them. His purpose was to destroy them and prevent the message from spreading. Everyone in, in life is on a road. I don't mean a physical road, some are on a physical road, but your life is, on a, is a path. Matthew 7, 13 to 14, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. The contrast, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We are that precious few. And those whom we influence to come into that fold are coming off of that broad road that leads to destruction and onto the narrow road that leads to life. Paul was not only on a road of personal destruction, but he was bent on destruction of all those who were followers of the way, which was the term that was used back then. His intended victims were on the narrow road. The word was spreading rapidly. Disciples were gaining converts in various places. So here comes Saul on a road of destruction and on the physical road to Damascus. Letter from the high priest in hand, seething with hate, bent on destruction. He's equipped He's motivated. 
and he's accompanied. Maybe it says he has people with him. Maybe there were temple guards, armed temple guards. Maybe the same ones that arrested Jesus in the garden. But there's no person that can change Saul's mind. Even Gamaliel wouldn't have been able to overcome this negative emotion, this fury that was driving Saul at this point. Jesus had an eye on Saul, not only to put a stop to his intended destruction, but God had a plan for Saul. I'm convinced that God had a plan from the start. God met him on the road to Damascus. God knows where and when to meet you. He knows where you are all the time. He knows what kind of road you're on. God knows where and when to interfere with your plan. That might be just something that you come up with all, all on your own instead of praying to God about it. He knows. And he knows where and when to detour your road. If it's on just your road and not where he wants you to be. Amen. God wants us to be on the narrow road. He wants us to be on his road. We don't know, but Saul was probably mounted on a horse. We don't know. It doesn't say that. There are artists that depict him on a horse and being knocked off of a horse with the bright light. But the distance from Jerusalem to Damascus is approximately 135 miles as the crow flies. There are different routes, but it, would have, it could have been 150. We don't know which way he went. But traveling by foot would have taken two weeks. You picture this just a quick, like a one-day travel down. No, it would have taken two weeks, give or take a few days at least. If he was mounted, he would have probably planned to drive the prisoners back there on foot. Saul was a mean man at this point. Mean, hateful man. But God had an eye on him. God had a plan for him to go on a road. It wasn't a pleasant one, but it was a glorious one. Acts chapter 9, 3 to 9, as he neared Damascus on his journey. Now this is after, a, after probably 10 or 12 days on the road. He nearing Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. What an exciting turn of events that was. Can you imagine? Can you just imagine? And Jesus says, now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Jesus just takes over sometimes. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. Now, if he was on a horse, why were they on foot? See, there's a clue right there. They're probably all on foot, I imagine. But they were traveling with him. They stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up, verse 8, from the ground. But when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blinded, not eat or drink anything. Saul was on or had been on his road, his own way, his own road. He was on a journey of his own choosing, a journey of death for those that he wanted to capture and bring back to Jerusalem. Nearing his chosen destination, now he is divinely interrupted. The brilliant light from heaven stopped him in his tracks, stopped him on his road, his path. God had a new road for him, a different road, a road he would travel for the rest of his life. Saul fell to the ground. So brilliant was the light that, that flashed around him. This was a light from heaven. It wasn't just a lightning bolt. It was a light from heaven, brilliant. Jesus spoke to him, why are you persecuting me? If you are persecuting people of the way, 
you are persecuting Jesus. Who are you? Saul can't see. I'm Jesus. Now get up and go into this city. You will be told. In other words, your road, your chosen path is going to be changed. You're gonna, I'm going to tell you, you're going to do what I say now. So he's led by the hand into the city. It says, so they led him. Who led him? His companions, his accomplices, the temple guards. After they led him into the city, what happened to them? Were they converted also? Did this really make a powerful impact on them? I think it would. Did they continue on that mission? Did they take the letter? Did they abandon the mission? I wonder, but we don't know. But we do know what became of Saul. He was blind and on a fast for three days, didn't need anything. Somehow he got into a house on Straight Street. Somebody led him there. Meanwhile, God spoke to a believer, Ananias, to go to the house where Saul was staying to pray for him. He didn't go to Ananias' house. He was led to, to a house on Straight Street, and God spoke to Ananias, said, go down there and pray for Saul. We pick it up in verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, and ask for a man named Tarsus, named, from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. Ananias could have been one of the very ones that he may have wanted to capture and take back to Jerusalem. It's possible. Verse 14, and he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people, and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus with the very people that he wanted to bring back and have them executed and destroyed in a most gruesome way. Saul's new road would be drastically different from the old one. He came to a saving knowledge of Jesus as Messiah, an idea that he had been violently opposed to so much that he was wanted to stomp them out. The scales fell from his eyes. Now he could see. Now he could see with his spirit the truth of the gospel. The truth that Jesus, whom he hated and persecuted, was truly the Messiah. Saul now is on a new road. He is appointed to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. That was scary enough, being, being a, rabb a rabbinical Jew trained as a Pharisee. They didn't want anything to do with, with Gentiles. There was a wall between them. And now he's going to be carrying the gospel to the Gentiles. And uh, many cities in the Gentile world, he started churches, he went to synagogues and preached the gospel. But he experienced a lot of hardships. 
He would start a lot of churches. He would write a large portion of the New Testament. Saul had come to a crossroads. He had come to a place where Jesus got his attention. In his encounter with Ananias, he was baptized. That means that he was saved. Why would you get baptized if you didn't get saved? He was baptized. That means that he'd been saved. He could have refused. He could have resisted God. Doesn't force anyone. He capitulated. And God set his feet, feet on a new path. He chose the narrow way. It's not an easy way. But that's the one he chose because that's what Jesus said to do. This is where, what you're going to do. So in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter, enter through the narrow gate. And I read it before, read it again. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Who's phone, whoever phoned that is, go ahead and, go ahead and silence it. <laughs> Bob, is that your phone? No? Oh, Lori, is that your phone? Carol, is that your phone? No. Should I stomp on it? Should I stomp on it? Should I stomp on it? I guess it's done. Okay, so Ananias was on a road too. We all are. Ananias' path crossed Saul's path. God sets things up that way. You carry the gospel. You're on that path, and you run across people who need to be on your path. God's path. Our path is not always easy. The enemy tries to interfere. He tries to stop us. The path has obstacles. Sometimes we can't see what's ahead. Sometimes there's quicksand. Sometimes there are boulders that he puts in our way. Sometimes we have uphill battles. We have illnesses. We have all kinds of challenges, financial challenges and trouble. I preached a sermon about trouble one time. If you're never molested and everything is peachy, you probably are no threat to the enemy. Paul went to work, stayed on that new path, and brought many people with him. But his hardship was legendary. Beatings, imprisonment, shipwrecks, trouble, trouble, trouble. And in the end, he was executed. Just the very thing he wanted to do to the believers in Damascus. His road, his road led to a great highway, Isaiah 35, 8 to 10, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. That's the road we want to be on, isn't it? You want to be on that highway? What road are you on now? Are you on the narrow way? At some point... Every believer comes to a crossroad. It might be someone else's crossroad, but you're the person who's there to minister. And at some point, believers decide to get off, to get off of their own road and to go on to the road that leads to God. At some point, every believer has had that experience. Get off the road you were on, the broad load, or the broad load. The, the broad road that leads to destruction. And you have gotten on to that narrow road. Every believer has done that. 
We all know who, people who are on the broad way that leads to destruction. Saul was leading not only to his own destruction, but everybody he could find. He wanted to destroy them. He was on that broad road. But people that are on that broad road are all around us. They're in our families, their coworkers, their friends, their neighbors. So can your path cross with their path? Can you be an influencer for God to people that are on a destruction road? Can you do that? Can you be a soul winner? That's an important question. And I'm here to tell you this is not a hard thing to do. Learn some scriptures. Learn a version of the sinner's prayer. And be bold enough to step out to someone that's on the wrong road, on the wrong path, or just hurting. Sometimes people come, they're hurting. They're in turmoil. They're they're in grief or turmoil of some kind, and they need God, they need Jesus, but they don't know that. So their path intersects with yours, and you can lead people to the Lord, and then you can bring them to church. <laughs> get them saved, and then, he said, a pastor said, get them saved, and then bring them to church, because, uh, because sinners don't want to come to church, but they'll cross your path, amen, they will. Amen. They will. I've, I end almost all my sermons with that same challenge. <laughs> and I don't know exactly why that is. It must be that we need to hear it. But most of my sermons funnel down into that challenge of being a soul winner. And uh, that's what we need to do. Amen. That's what we need to do. Would you stand? 1153. You could probably get to the church before the Baptist or Presbyterians do. I mean the church, I mean the restaurant. <laughs> or they might already be there. I don't know, probably. Anyway, um, it's nice to have Harold Fulmer, a visitor with us today. Doors are open to them. Yeah, yeah, we just gotta go out there and bring them in. <laughs> yeah. Well, Harold, hurry back. We, oh, yeah. we yeah. will, we will love you. Yeah, we're good at, we're good at that. Amen. Oh, yeah. We're good at that. Well, yeah, thank you. It's nice to have Ava with us today. Eva. Oh, Eva. I keep, I keep making that same mistake. Ava, Eva. When we baptized you, you were about a head shorter than you are now. You're grown. Anyway, bow your heads with me. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around today and, and feast on your word, to have delightful fellowship with people of like Christian faith. And we pray, Lord, as we go our separate ways, that you will bring us back together safely next time we meet in Jesus name. Amen. Next time we meet by the way is on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. <laughs>